Dear Father God, as we gather in your presence today, and as we break open the bread of life, I pray, Father, that you will change our lives. I pray, Father, that we will not leave this house of prayer as the same men and women and boys and girls who came in in the last few hours. I pray, Father, that we will be drawn closer to you in worship and adoration. I pray that our faith will have deeper roots, and I pray that our witness for you will burn brighter and brighter despite the gathering gloom. Father, I pray that you speak through me, you speak for me, and that all that happens today in these next few moments brings honor and glory to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So, uh, many years ago, back in 1913, a famous explorer called Ernest Shackleton um, posted an ad in the London Times, and you see the ad there on the screen. Um, well, I hope it's there. It says, Men Wanted. Uh, the, uh, it says, Men Wanted for Hazardous Journey, Small Wages, Bitter Cold, a bit like Michigan, Long Months of Complete Darkness, Constant Danger, Safe Return Doubtful, Honor and Recognition in Case of Success. It's a very famous ad in the London Times. He was inundated with multiple thousands of men begging to be on this mystery expedition. We like challenges, don't we? And there were thousands of men in London in the early 1900s who wanted a challenge like this. Only a handful actually joined him on the trans-Antarctic trek. He was gonna walk from one side of the Antarctic to the other side of the Antarctic. And uh, so that's what they did. Uh, but they got stuck along their way and their ship was caught in the ice flows and it was crushed around them. And some of them had to sail a small boat uh, about 800 miles through the stormy, roaring 40s off to an island where there was a British outpost. And they eventually rescued, um, over a year later, the survivors. It was an incredible story of um, survival and just sheer determination to get through the crisis. And in a sense, uh, the Apostle Paul understood exactly what these explorers were going through. The job description today for a pioneer church planter serving among the unreached uh, may actually um, correspond to this advert that Shackleton wrote in the London Times. Uh, if you turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see there how the Apostle Paul describes or gives the job description for a frontline church planter, a missionary, an evangelist, and uh, we ha you have many evangelists in this congregation, we say praise the Lord for that. And he gives the description in 2 Corinthians 11 of what it means to be a frontline church planter. I'm going to pick up the text uh, in, in my Bible here, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, I'm going to talk, pick it up from verse 23. It says, are they ministers of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless floggings, and often near death. Five times I have received from the Jews the lash, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three, day, three times I was shipwrecked. On a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, hungry and thirsty, often without food, cold, and naked. And besides other things, I am under daily pressure because of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I am not indignant? But if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And as he goes on to say as in his description of his ministry in 2 Corinthians 12, and verse 10, he brings this, this autobiographical section to an end. He says, therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And I would say today that that first century job description of a pioneer church planter really hasn't changed over the centuries. Now, in AFM, we produce a nice glossy magazine, and there's about 100 out in the foyer. I'd encourage you to pick one up as you go home today. And we tell the stories of people being led to Jesus Christ among uh, Hindu, Muslim, animist, and Buddhist communities. But what we don't tell are the stories so much of the personal cost, the cost of seeing your children physically or sexually assaulted, the cost of being run out of town by a mob, 
The cost of staying in a country when there's an Ebola outbreak and you can't get to the airport, you just have to hunker down and pray the outbreak passes by without you dying a very horrible death. Uh, some people like to go and uh, travel around the 1040 mission window, and uh, they like the sites, they like the temples, they like the mountains. And uh, if you see up on the screen here, there's a couple of slides I'd like to show, just a couple of maps that give us a sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, on the screen there, you'll see a map of the world. And if you look closely at the screen, there's a circle that encompasses China and India and Southeast Asia. Now, there are more people living inside that circle than living outside that circle. It gives you an idea of the po relative population density in our world today. Now, on the next slide here, you have what we call as missiologists the 1040 mission window, which is 10 to 40 degrees north of the equator. And um, that is the area of the greatest poverty, the, the worst political violence, the highest infants and, mortal and, uh, infants and, mother and maternal mortality rates around the world. It truly is a place of great human suffering. Uh, those you see on the screen there, the, the countries of the 1040 mission window, that's where most of our AFM missionaries work today. That is where they're needed. And if you're ever thinking of being a missionary, the chances are you're going to be in one of those countries maybe spending the next 30 years raising your family, learning the language, and planting congregations. And the next slide you see really emphasizes where we are as Adventists today. Because on this slide here, the green dots are cities of a million with more than 20,000 Adventists. But the red dots are those cities of the world with more than a million inhabitants with fewer than 125 Adventists. And this slide here graphically illustrates the challenge of the 1040 mission window. We do well as Adventists, where when we go into a community and say, this is the word of God, such as Latin America or Central America, people already accept that. But when you go to a country where they have their own sacred scriptures, you're starting from a much more fundamental starting point. You have the Bible, we have the Quran. You have the Bible, we have the Bhagavad Gita or other Hindu or Buddhist scriptures and so forth. And so you're starting from a much more a difficult um, starting point in the discussion. Uh, many years ago, I was in Nepal, and I was, um, you know, I was there for a few days, so I did the tourist stuff. I was looking around, the, the river goes to the center of Kathmandu, and bes beside the river, they cremate the bodies, and these, these funeral pyres are left burning for days, and the air really stinks, it's really awful. And you see these holy men sitting there, and their faces are covered in white powder, and they have what seems to be like python snakes crawling around their necks, and they want you to pay a few rupees to take a picture with it, and I stay well clear of snakes. Uh, I don't particularly like snakes. Um, but the thing is you get Westerners by the tens of thousands go to places like Nepal, they go trekking, they go and see Mount Everest, but when you go there as a missionary, what you see is 30 million people laboring under the fear of demons. And everywhere you go, you see a little red dot of wax or a red mark on a tree, on a stone, um, on a plant, on the side of a building, and that is now a, a divinity for somebody in that community. And as people walk through that community, they will stop and make puja, offer their worship before each of those representations of a demon because they are scared of the demons and their power over their lives. So Westerners will go to these countries and say, oh, they're nice pictures, this is a cute-looking temple, this is a nice-looking holy man, or look at that python. But you go there as a missionary, and you realize that these nations are filled with spiritual darkness and all the pain that goes with it. And you realize how wonderful the gospel truly is, that there is one God, not millions of deities, and he is a God of love, not a God to be appeased, that he sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, or that through him the world might be saved. The gospel is truly wonderful, wonderful news. And when we live in a country with a Judeo-Christian heritage like America, we sometimes forget how beautiful the gospel really is. But when you go to countries in the 1040 mission window where other gods hold sway, you might say, you realize the spiritual darkness that exists out there. So let's dwell for a moment on the nature of that problem and uh, we're going to focus on Psalm 74 and verse 20. Now, the text will be on the screen. If you want to follow in your own Bibles, that's fine. Um, but we're going to be looking for a few minutes at Psalm 74 and verse 20. And Psalm 74 and verse 20 um, is believed to be a psalm written during the Babylonian exile. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has come three times. He's uh, taken Daniel and his three friends on the first um, visit to Jerusalem in 605 B.C., and uh, then he finally destroys Jerusalem a few years later, 
and the Jews are taken captive, and the remnant who are with the prophet Jeremiah, they flee down to, um, they flee down to Egypt, despite God saying, do not do this. And Psalm 74 is believed to be a psalm written during the Babylonian exile, and uh, the Jews are looking back at the destruction of Jerusalem, the tearing down of the temple, their national pride is gone, the center of their universe has been destroyed, it appears that God has forsaken them, and they're not reading the prophecies of Jeremiah that says 70 years is going to be this captivity in Jeremiah 29. They seem to have forgotten that particular prophecy, and they're, they're sunk in this psalm here in their despair. And so they start off in verse 1 with this passage here. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? They do not use the words against your people. The idea of the sheep of your pasture, this is injecting a tone of tenderness into the psalm. Lord, you see your congregation. You see your sheep, including your lambs. Why are you angry with these innocent lambs of yours? And then the psalmist goes on to describe the, the, the pain of seeing the destruction of Jerusalem. It says there, your enemies roar in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their banners for signs. They seem like men who lift up axes among the thick trees, and now they break down its carved work all at once with axes and hammers. They have set fire to your sanctuary. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name to the ground. They said in their hearts, let us destroy them altogether. They have burned up all the meeting places of God in the land. And so the psalmists are reflecting on the fact that the center of their universe has now gone. And for Jews in the time of Daniel and, and, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, all of whom were contemporaries at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, it seems unthinkable that Jerusalem is gone. It's just a pile of ruins. The psalmist goes on. And he talks about the despair that they, they do not sense that God is even with them in their Babylonian captivity. They say, we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there anyone among us who knows how long. O oh God, how long will the adversary reproach? Will the enemy blaspheme your name forever? And so then the, then the psalmist turns from verse 11 through to the next 10 verses. We're not going to read those. To recount to God how God has saved his people in the past. They tell the story of the Exodus. They tell the story of the parting of the Red Sea. They tell the story of the manna. They tell the story of the parting of the River Jordan so they can enter into the promised land. It is good for us in moments of crisis to recount what God has done for us. And it's interesting that when you see people making transitions in the Scripture, whether it's Moses to Joshua, Joshua to the leaders of Israel, David to Solomon, or Paul to the elders of the church of, of um, Ephesus, each time they recount what God has done in the past for that group of people. Because when you pass on the story, you're encouraging them and you're saying, you're going to face challenges as well, but this is how God worked for us in the past. You can hold to him. I would encourage you as you, in your own families, maybe at the end of the year, to sit down and recount what God has done for you. Maybe make, it a, maybe make it a custom at Thanksgiving to share within your family God's providence, His protection, His guidance during the previous year. Our children need to hear this. They need to be raised with the stories of God's protection and providence and guidance. So when they are mature and they face challenges of their own, they have a, a, a reservoir of testimonies of God's goodness and faithfulness within their own families. But then the psalmist goes on to say this. And this is the verse I want to dwell on here. It says, have respect to the covenant for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. Now I've put four versions up on the screen so we get the sense. The New Revised says, have regard for your covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the haunts of violence. The, New, the King James says, have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. And the New American says, consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. And so what the psalmist is saying here is that when people dwell outside of the covenant relationship with God, the inevitable result is violence. And some of you are nodding your heads this morning. When people dwell away from that saving covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father, the inevitable um, cycle and spiral of human behavior is downwards. And the psalmist is, is, is uh, mentioning this in this passage here because the people of Israel are experiencing the violence of the Babylonians. O daughter Babylon, happy shall they be who take your infants and dash their heads against the rocks because you did it to us. Psalm 139. 
unspeakable violence took place in the conquest of Jerusalem. Now, just to dwell on this passage here, just look at some of the words there in the Hebrew. Have regard for your covenant, for the dark places of the land, that word in Hebrew is Eretz. Nowadays you have Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, are full, male, of the haunts of violence. And the word that is used is Hamas. Have you heard the name Hamas in the news? There is a Palestinian group, their name is Hamas. It means violence. It also means uh, rejection against established order, against um, that which is in place. And so in this passage here, the psalmist says that the dark places of the world, um, my version says land, but the word Eretz means the world, they are filled with violence. Not just violence, but the haunts of violence where violence is celebrated. That word male, it actually means to be full, to be covered, to be massed, to be overflowing, to be gratified, or to be satisfied. That is, um, it's not just the world is filled with violence, but the yearning of men's hearts is for violence. That men find satisfaction engaging in violence or watching violence. And you know that's true because one of the most popular genres of movies these days is action movies. And people enjoy watching action movies, and we get pleasure in watching the violent deaths of other people. It's a paradox. Even Christians glory in violence and the destruction of those who bear the image of God. Now, the word Hamas, it means violence or cruelty or wrongdoing. It means to treat violently or to injure another. So in this verse, the psalmist is saying is the natural state of humanity outside of a covenant relationship with God is manifest by a yearning and a satisfaction with and a looking for violence and cruelty one to another. As in the time of the psalmist, so today. So violence is endemic in the 21st century in the world in which we live. Whether it be abuse in all of its forms, whether it be human trafficking and the sex trade, whether it be neglect, whether it be substance abuse, the list goes on and on and on. Brokenness and the yearning for violence is now the norm for fallen humanity. And this violence permeates our marital relationships, it permeates our family relationships, it permeates our community relationships, and it permeates our national and our international relationships. No relationship on planet Earth today is immune from the lust for violence, our desire to dominate somebody else. Every relationship known to humanity is poisoned by our yearning for domination over somebody else or over another nation or another group. And even as a nation, we glory in violence, uh, you see movies like Top Gun and, and so forth, we glorify in our ability to kill other people as a nation. We celebrate our ability to kill large quantities of people very efficiently. Am I speaking the truth here, brothers and sisters? Yeah, I'm speaking the truth. Now, the psalmist in this verse here is echoing the state of humanity before the flood. And so on the screen there, you'll see that uh, Genesis 6 and verse 11 has the same three, verse, three words there. It says there, now the earth was filled, or the, the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. So Genesis 6, 11 has those three same verse, words. The earth, the Eretz, was filled, Male, with violence, Hamas. So before the flood, when God said, I'm going to wipe out this world, and I'm going to start over, the earth was filled with violence. And not only was the earth filled with violence, but the next verse of Genesis 6 and 13 says, God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth, the Eretz, is filled, Male, with violence, Hamas, because of them. Now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. And so just as the psalmists experienced a world filled with violence, so as in the days of Noah, the earth was filled with violence. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 24 and verse 37, he says, for as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, Jesus goes on to say that they are eating and they are drinking, they are marrying and they are giving in marriage, but if we're to take everything we know about the flood, the pre-flood times, we can also deduce that before Jesus comes again, our world is going to be filled not with peace and long-suffering and community harmony, it's going to be filled with violence. And is that the world in which we live today? Oh yes, yeah, that's the world in which we live today. We're going to be living in a society and a world that is filled with um, pointless, but endless violence. 
This is hardly good news, but this is the reality of serving among the 1040 win mission, the peoples of the 1040 mission window, those who are outside of the new covenant relationship with God. Now, I've, I've traveled you know, pretty much continually since the age of 18. That's 32 years on the road. And I can tell you that um, there are some countries where you fly in and you read the glossy in-flight magazine brochure and you don't believe a word of it because you've been there before and you know what it's like. And there are some countries you fly to and you know there really is a problem because when you look in the glossy in-flight magazine, there are adverts for armed patrol guard, for, for, for um, um, trained Rottweilers and Dobermans. There are adverts for 24-7 armed response units, private security teams. There are adverts for, for barbed wire, razor wire configurations at your home. And you know when you're flying into a country and you see ads for razor wire and, and armed security teams, oh, something's not quite right in this nation. And we see this in more and more countries around the world today. And in the 1040 mission window and beyond, human trafficking and gender-based violence and the persecution of religious and other minorities, including Christians, ethnic cleansing, linguicide, and then genocide um, plague parts of the 1040 mission window today. The fear of violence is a daily companion for many. Back in 2015, I was in Iraq. Um, ISIS came across northern Syria into uh, northern Iraq. And um, the Christians fled from the plains of Nineveh, where um, the prophet Jonah was. Actually, the, uh, Jonah was a very successful missionary. He doesn't realize it. He maybe didn't know it at the time. But today, the largest group of Christians in Iraq are the Assyrians, the ethnic Assyrians, where Jonah was up in ancient Nineveh. Nowadays, it's the city of Mosul. And around the city of Mosul, you get a region called, district called the Plains of Nineveh. And the Christians fled from the arrival of ISIS from the west they fled east into um, Iraqi-controlled Kurdistan, and there was a city in, in northern Iraq, Kurdistan, called Erbil, and in, in Erbil, there's a small district. It's shaped like a pie wedge, and it's about two miles wide at the, narrow, at the widest bit, and it comes down to just a sliver of land. And in that pie of land, in the city, the district of Ankoa, it's called, in the city of Erbil, the Christians of northern Syria and northern Iraq gathered. That was their Alamo in 2015. They were armed to the teeth because they knew that if ISIS came down that road, nobody was gonna lift a finger to save them. This was their last stand in 2015, the Christians of northern Iraq. The fear of violence is truly a problem for many in our world today. The dark places of the earth, that is they do not have the, the light of the world shining in them, that is Jesus Christ, are filled with a yearning and a desire and a lust for violence. That's the problem. And as missionaries, we see this. And when you go into countries as missionaries, you go there knowing that there is real danger. And you go there knowing that your life is cheap and many will celebrate if you are killed in the course of your time there. That your death will not be greeted as a national outrage, it'll be viewed with a, as a cause of celebration among many people in that country. So what is God's solution? Well, God does have a solution and that solution really is the gospel. And uh, God's solution is found not in so much a text, but God's solution is found in the person of Jesus Christ. So they say that, that preaching is the proclamation by the spoken word from the, living, from the written word of the living word. And so God's solution is not to um, bring more violence into planet Earth, but it is to send the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace comes into the world, into the dark places of the world. John 8 and verse 12, Jesus spoke to his disciples and he said to them, he says, John 8 verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. To a world sunk in the violence of spiritual darkness, God sent his son to be the light of the world. And that light shines in the darkness. John 1 verse 5 in the prologue of John's gospel, it says this, it says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Let's just hold that on the screen for a minute. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not overcome it. Now implicit within this verse is the idea there is conflict between light and darkness. Is that right? There is the light of the world and the darkness was not able to overwhelm it. It means that the darkness is always trying to overwhelm the light, but the light still shines. And so that light in this passage here is relating specifically to Jesus Christ as the light of the world. Uh, the um, darkness by its very nature cannot coexist with light. 
Where there is light, it always dispels the darkness. Darkness never seeks a, a, um, a modus operandi, a modus vivendi, never seeks a, um, a manner of coexisting with light. You cannot have light coexisting with darkness. The darkness will try and overwhelm the light, but if the light has power in it, it will always shine and it will always dispel the darkness. So if I will put a candle here right now um, and light it, uh, you wouldn't see much of that candle because there's so much light in this room. But if we were to turn the lights off here and come back at midnight, everybody in the room would see that candle. The candle hasn't changed. What has changed is the darkness has gathered around it. And now the light is more visible. So people worry, how am I going to be in the final crisis before Jesus comes again? We'll live a life that is given over to the following of the Holy Spirit, a life that is um, an overflow of the love of Jesus Christ today. You're not going to have to worry about too much because that's who you're going to be in that final crisis. And people will see the light of your life. So there is conflict between light and darkness. Darkness and light cannot coexist, not just in theological terms, but darkness and light cannot coexist in my home nor in yours, in my heart nor in yours. And maybe you have come to church today and there's an element of darkness in your home. Maybe there's a tinge of darkness in your heart. And you know there's something there. Maybe it's a cherished sin. Maybe it's something that you know you, that shouldn't be in your life, but you kind of play with this and you've got kind of used to it and you excuse it to yourself. But I want to challenge you today to go home and stay and put that out of your life. To repent of that thing and to confess it and give it over to God. You do not need that conflict within your heart or within your home. A house divided is not gonna stand in the final crisis. If we're to be ready for that final crisis before Jesus comes again, we need to be making our lives ready now. That is building our lives on the teachings of Jesus, Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. The wise man builds his house upon the rock and he doesn't mix sand in with the rock. So we are to clean our lives of this darkness that inhabits the world around. Tragically today, we all experience that conflict in our lives, in our ministry. Satan pushes back on pastors and on Bible workers and on amazing fax workers and on AFM missionaries. We see it, he tries to discourage us, to depress us, to divert us, uh, to deny us access to countries and to destroy the bodies of those who carry and represent the light of the world to the unreached and dark haunts of violence. Every time that blood-stained banner is planted in the middle of an unreached people group, that blood is often our own, or generally it's that of our children. That's the reality of mission work. Your children pay a price. If you serve as a missionary, your children will pay a price. If you answer the call to gospel ministry here in the United States, there is a very strong possibility your children will pay a price. How does Satan discourage gospel workers, whether they are here or overseas? It's by attacking their children. And he attacks you where you're, you're most vulnerable, and he attacks you where it hurts the most, and he attacks you where there may be a sense of shame involved, or you don't want to talk about it, but you get involved in ministry on the outside, but on the inside, there is a terrible pain and shame that you're battling with on a daily basis. Every time a new believer enters the body of Christ, the bodies of those we love, particularly our children, seem to suddenly experience illness and pain. I experience this on a regular basis when I, with my colleagues, engage in deliverance ministry. I have a son at Southern, and he knows that when we engage in deliverance ministry and somebody says, Pastor, there's a shadow in my life, there's a demon in my life, I played with an Ouija board as a teenager or as a college, and now um, I, the, these things are coming true in my life, or I had my horoscope read, or my mother was a witch, or whatever the entry point is into that person's life, my boy knows that when I fast and pray for a couple of days with a couple of colleagues, and we go and visit that person and anoint them and drive out the demons, my boy knows is that Satan attacks my son. He knows that. So I used to tell him, David, this is what's gonna happen. You need to prepare yourself because Satan's gonna push back and you're gonna get hurt. And he knows this and I know that. And yet if you're, being, if you're gonna be involved in ministry, it's a whole family business. It's not just me doing stuff, my family at home not involved. We're, my entire family is fair game for satanic attacks once I or you engage in ministry. And so the whole family needs to understand this. We had one missionary in, in Benin. Um, uh, this missionary um, was, uh, he's from West Africa himself. 
and has many years' experience in deliverance ministry, and they consecrated their home. And uh, then the missionary made the comment to his wife at family worship that we've consecrated the home, so now we, can f- we don't need to worry about Satan attacking our children. And the child, his uh, infant, was lifted from his mother's lap and carried through the air to the kitchen right the other end of the house and dumped in a pot of boiling water, and all the skin came off his left leg. Uh, this is what happened to that missionary child. These things happen, and the missionary realized, oh yes, the demons are present even within these four walls. This stuff happens in the mission field. Ministry, whether you're a pastor in in Sacramento or a missionary in the 1040 mission window, is really two steps forward followed by another two steps forward. In reality, it's one step forward. It is one step sideways. It is one step back. Maybe a pause to lick your wounds before you summon the courage to launch forward again. And all missionaries bear scars, whether they are physical scars, emotional scars, or psychological scars. Pastors also bear scars. They're very good at hiding it. But pastors also bear scars. It is not easy to be involved in gospel ministry these days. And those scars um, are are, are earned precisely because those missionaries did not shrink from God's call in their life. And as such, those scars are nothing to be ashamed of, but they're badges of honor. Because it's our privilege to go and serve and bear the gospel to the ends of the earth. We follow in the feet of Jesus when we, de- when we do so. And if Jesus experienced persecution and rejection and was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, that then is the lot of frontline missionaries today. Jesus does not say in that passage on the screen, the light shines in the darkness. So he does not say the light shone in the darkness. John does not write that. He says the light shines in the darkness. That is, it's a present active in this verse. So uh, in this passage, it doesn't read that Jesus came and he shone like a comet going through the sky and then he left and went back to heaven and the light is now gone. This passage here says that the light is shining in the darkness and this was written after the ascension of Jesus to Jerusalem. So what is John talking about here? In what sense is the light of Jesus remaining as a shining force in our world today? Well, Jesus explained it in Matthew chapter five and verse 14. And he says to the church of Granite Bay, you, church of Granite Bay, you are the light of the world. A city built built on a hill, you're on a hilltop here, cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives lights to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father, which is in heaven. And so we are commissioned to be the light of the world today. You are commissioned to be the light of the world in your workplace, in your home, in your marriage, with your children. Are you serving as the light of the world? Does the light of the love of God shine in your life? Do people see this? Do people take note of this? Do people even know that you are a Christian? Do people even know that? Do people um, talk about the fact that your life maybe is different, that you have different values to the values of this world, that when somebody's being hurt in society um, or hurt in the workplace, that you show empathy and sympathy and compassion and you stand by them? Do they see the principle of forgiveness in your life? Forgiveness is a uniquely Christian principle, and our world is in dire need of forgiveness. Jesus represented his churches in the book of Revelation as seven golden lampstands, and there's a great truth in that picture because a candle not only gives out light, but it gives out soot and smoke. It is totally unrealistic for a cat to expect a candle to only give out light. The very nature of a candle is to give out light and soot and also smoke. No candle has ever given out light alone, but we, his church, are represented as a candlestick, which means we don't give off a pure light, we give off a smoky light. Individually and corporately, we are not perfect. But our experience of the body of Christ will be determined whether we choose to look at the light or whether we choose to look at the smudges on the roof. There will always be soot or smoke in the body of Christ, but we are called to look to the light. And Jesus' response, God's response to the dark places of the world being filled with violence was not only to send his son, Jesus Christ, but it was to call us to be the light of the world until Jesus comes back again. And if you have never studied with somebody and you've seen the lights go on when they accept the gospel, I I challenge you to ask your pastors today, is there somebody I can study with? Because when you study with somebody and the light goes on in their eyes and you see they get the gospel and they've internalized it, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. It's the most beautiful thing. And so uh, many years ago, 
I was in some part of the Middle East studying with a Muslim family, and uh, we went through we went through a few few days studying together. And this uh, the the as we uh, to, on the end of the final at the end of the week, I invited them to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they all agreed to it, and they were baptized the next day. But as we were studying with them, um, this Muslim lady she opened her Bible to Romans chapter five and verse eight. And uh, Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 8 are beautiful passages to study with Muslims. But she pointed to Romans 5 and verse 8, which says that God proves his love for us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And she looked at me and she said, this is so beautiful. There is no picture of God like this in my Muslim faith. That God is a God of love and God sent his son to die for me. And he sent his son to die for me while we were yet a planet in rebellion and hostile to God. And the lights went on and the tears flowed and you realize just how beautiful the gospel truly is. So what is our role today? <clears throat> well, we do have a role. I want to go back to our scripture reading today. Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey uh, was sent from the city of Antioch, that's in southeastern Turkey of today, and they went from, from Antioch to Cyprus, and from Cyprus they went north into southern Turkey of today, and they went to the cities of Perga and Antioch in Pisidia. And there they proclaimed the gospel, and uh, you see that passage on the screen. Paul concludes his gospel presentation with this uh, appeal. He said, but he whom God raised up experienced no corruption. Let it be known to you therefore, my brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins, of, of sins is proclaimed to you. By this Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from all those sins which you could not be, from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. This is truly good news, yes? You can be set free from all your sins of the past, okay? And uh, last uh, week I preached a sermon and uh, I got an email this morning from a lady somewhere in the world who said that her daughter watched that sermon and was, was overwhelmed and confessed to a terrible crime and handed herself into the authorities. And that lady spoke about the peace that her daughter now has. To be set free by the gospel from a terrible crime and the guilt that, that you carry, the burdens of guilt. Well, when Paul proclaimed the message of the gospel to the, in, to the Jews and to the Gentiles in, in Turkey there, um, he was kind of rejected by, by, the, um, by the crowds. And the next Sabbath he came back and so many Gentiles came that the Jews of that city were filled with jealousy. And so the, the story goes on in verse 45. It says there, but when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and blaspheming. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. And so Paul then responded with these very, very famous words, words that apply to us today. And what did he say? He said, then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, that is, to the Jews of that particular synagogue. But since you reject it and judge yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life, we are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now this prophecy that you will be a light to the ends of the earth, a light for the Gentiles, was first spoken of about the people of Israel in Isaiah 41 and Isaiah 49. God planned for a people to be a light to the world. When Jesus was dedicated in the temple by Simeon in Luke chapter two, Simeon quoted this prophecy over Jesus and said, you are destined to be a light to the Gentiles. But then Paul, when he's the first missionary on his first missionary journey, he claims this passage, he appropriates it for frontline missionaries and said it's not just applying to the people of Israel and it doesn't just apply to Jesus himself. This passage applies to every frontline missionary, in fact, every disciple of Jesus today. We are called to be a light for the Gentiles. That is our calling, that is our purpose. And I thank the Lord for the ministry of this church and Amazing Facts TV and the light that goes around the world from this church. Um, but this is our calling today to be a light to the Gentiles. So the fulfillment of this prophecy was found in the work of the people of Israel, then the work of Jesus, then the work of the apostles, and by extension, we are also to be a fulfillment of this prophecy. We are also to be a light for the Gentiles. Now, historically, there have been many uh, but uh, profoundly inadequate motives for mission. Some people may be thinking today, well, maybe I'd like to be a missionary, or maybe I feel a call to gospel ministry. But if you are sensing the call to be a missionary, um, there have been some historical but very inadequate motives for this. One was the imperialist motive. 
That was to turn the converts into the docile subjects of secular colonial authorities. Another inadequate motive was the cultural motive. That's the transfer of the missionary's allegedly superior culture to another country. There's a fascinating study from Southeast Asia that shows that you can tell which country the missionaries came from by what people wear in church 150 years later. And the American missionaries, they wore kind of more, they didn't have the ties like the British missionaries did, and you can tell that in the churches even to this day. That's, the, that's the, what Christianity is based on the missionaries' cultural norms. Some people have a romantic motive. That is, you want to go overseas for adventure and find food and all the rest of it. And I can tell you that there is not much truth to the romantic motive. When you've had you know, ganja gut or deli belly for a few days, the romantic motive disappears very fast. There is also the ecclesiastical motive. That's the desire to export your confession to establish your church's authority in another part of the world. These are inadequate and really unbiblical motivations. Some people have them as missionaries, and really they should not have those motivations. But there have been better motives throughout the history of missions. One was the conversion motive. You might say this is the focus of the evangelicals. This emphasizes making personal decisions for Jesus Christ, which is good, but it narrows the kingdom of God to the number of visible saved souls. Then there is also the eschatological motive, which points believers to the second coming. That's where we major as Adventists. The challenge with the focusing on the eschatological motive is you ignore present injustices within society. Then you have the church planting motive, which we have in AFM, to build congregations of Seventh-day Adventists around the world, but this exclusively identifies the visible church with God's kingdom, and that's not always true. Then you may have the philanthropic motive, such as the Salvation Army, which works for justice and the alleviation of suffering in this world, but it, limit, it uh, limits God's kingdom to social improvements in this world alone. And our time is moving on. So why do we serve? Well, some, why do people today, why are they willing to bear such scars and to make such sacrifices? And if you are sensing the call to serve as a missionary, I want to tell you now, it is not romantic, it is not glamorous, it's where your life is, you die to Christ and you get planted in a foreign land and God will give the growth. But you have to be willing to die in that foreign land. Sometimes literally, often spiritually and metaphorically. And if you go into a closed access country where missionaries are not allowed, you almost disappear from the internet, like you don't exist. You have to be willing to make this kind of sacrifice for a much greater good and for the joy of seeing people among the lost accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. So why are so many today willing to carry such scars and bear such sacrifices? Well, first of all, we're compelled by the love of God. For the love of Christ, the love of God urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. God's love has entered into our lives and it now flows out of our hearts and our minds as a stream of life-giving water. Our sharing of the gospel is the natural overflow of a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father and it's but the organic expression of our own joyful experience of salvation. If you fall in love with somebody, it's hard to hide it, is it not? Like if you have a teenager in your house, okay, and, and they fall in love with somebody, you can tell. They don't have to tell you. They may try and hide it. And they may say, oh no, there's nothing happening there. You can tell. It's like body odor, you can't hide these things. You can't hide these things. When you are in love, it seeps out. When you're in love with Jesus Christ, it seeps out. When your life is governed by his teachings and his love and the principles of his kingdom, it seeps out. And so why are so many willing today to bear the, make the sacrifices and carry the scars of frontline missions? It's number one, because they are changed by the love of God. And the love of God flows out of them to people who oftentimes hate them in return. And when that people group molest your daughter, because that happens, it doesn't make the magazine, but it happens, you have to choose. Is love an emotion or is love a principle? Are we gonna stay or are we gonna head home? Those are hard decisions that missionaries have to make. And we encourage them each time to dwell upon the love of Christ for them. And what does that mean for them and their family? Sometimes it means coming home, sometimes it means staying. Secondly, why do so many people accept the call to gospel service today? It's because through proclaiming the gospel throughout all nations, we are hastening the end. As you saw in the video I showed at the beginning, this gospel of the kingdom will be, will be proclaimed to all nations as a testimony to them, and then what? The end. 
shall come. And when the end comes, it means no more disease. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I'm not sure what you're trained to say in this. Some say amen, some say hallelujah, some say praise the Lord, some wave their hands. I'm not sure what your normal way of saying appreciation here, but uh, some, when Jesus comes again, all disease comes to an end, amen. All death comes to an end, amen. All divorce comes to an end. All drug addiction comes to an end. All despair and doubt and fear comes to an end. When Jesus comes again, all human suffering comes to an end and all animal suffering comes to an end. Now, I think that's a powerful motive for being a frontline gospel worker. And you can do that here in Sacramento or in California or in Mexico or to the ends of the earth. I wanna challenge you to think where, where are you gonna be doing, where are you gonna be playing your role as an individual church member? What part are you gonna play in making that possible? When we serve as frontline gospel workers, we serve today so that no tears will be shed tomorrow or for eternity. We also serve as missionaries because the cosmos reverberates with joy over every sinner who is welcomed into God's kingdom. In leading the lost to Calvary, we bring joy to our heavenly Father and to the angels of heaven. When every sinner is saved, there is a, a anguish among the demons of Satan and there is joy among the angels of God, which means that your ministry has a cosmic significance. When you agree to study the Bible with someone, when you share your testimony with somebody, when you pass on a glow tract, or you say, here's a copy of Steps to Christ, whatever you may do, there is a watching cosmos watching what you're doing. And those angels are cheering you on. Can you imagine what the angels are thinking? If you, if you, let's say you're a fan of, oh, I don't know, the, the Patriots as a random group. If you're a fan of the Patriots and you're sitting in the stadium and the Chicago Bears run out and you're waiting for your team to come out, but they never arrive on the field, you're gonna be kind of disappointed, yes? Imagine how the angels feel when you're sitting in a plane next to somebody or in, the, in Walmart or wherever you may be, and somebody raises a question that has spiritual significance and you just switch the, the conversation to the weather. How do you think the angels must feel? Come on, guys. We're cheering for you. You share the gospel and there's rejoicing in heaven. You need to get in the fight. You need to be actively shining the light of the love of God in this particular community. And what is the result of turning from the darkness, from the abode of violence to the light of the world and to the Prince of Peace? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, this is how he records it. He says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord. There is joy when the gospel comes into people's lives. And maybe we've lived with the gospel for so long that we forget the sanctifying influence and the uplifting influence of the gospel within our lives or within our communities. But when there is no gospel presence within a community, the inevitable result is a decline into violence, political violence, ethnic violence, into communal violence. We see it all around our world today. When people turn to God and receive the agape love, and that washes away the Hamas violence, people experience a renewal of life that nothing else can bring. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We see it in our history, Corrie ten Boom, who survived the Nazi death camps, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and uh, Nelson Mandela in South Africa. Even in our own nation, when there is a race-based killing and you see an African-American man or mother, a father or mother standing up and offering forgiveness, that's the most powerful thing I see in American history time and again it's the forgiveness based on the well of a Christian faith that comes from African-American communities when they experience senseless violence. And that calls us to a higher standard of living. When people are willing to transcend the violence and to say, um, I'm not just going to offer you forgiveness because forgiveness involves one person, but I'm gonna work for reconciliation. Reconciliation involves two people. Then there is a powerful force for change, not just in how we live, but in the hearts of the people within that community. So our time is up. What are we gonna say in conclusion today? Well, our existence in this congregation, your existence, may be summarized in three simple questions. These are those three simple questions. Do you believe as a congregation that God's promises always come true? Yes, I believe that. Absolutely, they always come true. Number two, do you believe that the good news of the kingdom will go to the ends of the earth? Yes, you're participating in it with all your ministries that come out of this incredible congregation and the amazing facts ministries. Next question is this, and do you believe that God's promises will come through true through this congregation? Through this congregation, not just somebody else doing it, but through this congregation. I believe so. 
you have an outsized impact all around the world. I've been in countries where people watch Amazing Facts TV and come to Adventists and say, I would like to be baptized. This congregation has a reach around the world. And I want to say there's something else about frontline gospel work. We also need boots on the ground. Because I've met Muslims who've waited for years to meet a living Christian. They listen to 3ABN, they watch Amazing Facts, and they're waiting for a living Christian to turn up in their community who will disciple them and lead them into the body of Christ. We need radio and media, and we need boots on the ground. So I want to appeal to you today. If you sense that God is calling you to be a frontline missionary, I'm here for the rest of today, for the men's ministries tomorrow, please come and speak with me. We say in AFM that there are three things you can do um, to support frontline missions. They're up on the screen now. First of all, start praying that God will raise up missionaries to reach the unreached. Today it's about 40, 45% of the world. Jesus ain't coming anytime soon unless we get to work. That 40, 45% is growing with every year. We need frontline missionaries. Number two, start giving. I want to thank uh, the family where I'm staying for their hospitality. Giving doesn't have to be necessarily financial, but it can be uh, giving of your time. It may be participating in a prayer group. It may be giving word of encouragement to a passing missionary. If you're a clinician, it may be saying, I can give you, you know, a reduced rate medical care for your children who've been hurt in the mission field. There are many, many ways that you can give to support missions. Or you can go. And I'll say this after 30 plus years of living around the world, there's nothing I would ever do, there's nothing I would rather do than being a frontline missionary. Because you get to see the story of the book of Acts being written on a daily basis today. We get to see in the Philippines children raised from the dead, happened just a few years ago. We get to see miraculous healings. We get to see miracles that we read about in the Bible. They are still happening today. God does not change. His ways among fallen humanity are still as true and as glorious and as beautiful today as they were in the 28 chapters of the book of Acts. And he's still working. So you may go. And if you sense God calling you to be a frontline missionary, please come and speak with me today or tomorrow. You can go for one year or you can go for 30 years as a career missionary and make this your life calling. And uh, if a young person comes to this congregation and says, I want to be a student missionary or go with Adventist volunteer services or I want to go on a Maranatha trip or I want to go with AFM for a few years, support that young person. Give them encouragement. You may not be able to give of your time, but you can give of your resources so that they can be a blessing in the mission field. And if every mission, if I give you an arrow and every, the missionary represents the arrowhead, behind every arrowhead there's a shaft and there's feathers at the back. The arrowhead cannot reach its mark without the entire arrow being present. The missionaries may go overseas, but they need the whole body of Christ to be with them. And we can play that role as a congregation, so pray, give or go. There is something that each one of us can do in this congregation. When Jesus comes again, my prayer is that there'll be people on that sea of glass who are there because of the ministry of this congregation. Not just of this congregation, but because you stepped up and said, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. We are only in this congregation today because 2,000 years ago there were missionaries in the Eastern Mediterranean. And they carried the gospel to Western Europe. And they carried the gospel to North America and to Southeast Asia and to Africa. We have received the gospel today. We are the inheritors of an eternal treasure because somebody in the past left everything to answer the gospel call. And it cannot just stop with us. It needs to flow to the rest of the world. Pray, give, or go. There's something for all of us. We can some, each one of us can do something in that gospel task. My prayer is that we will all participate, we will experience the joys and the sacrifices of mission, and when Jesus comes again, there'll be many stars in our crowns because we answered the gospel message. We bow our heads, we humble our hearts, and today, Father, we thank you from the bottoms of our hearts that at some stage in the past, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl, shared the good news with someone in their community. Someone got on a boat, someone walked over land, someone rode on horseback, someone took a plane, and the good news came to my community and to my family. 
And I pray, Father, that each one of us will not just be recipients of that gospel, but we will be channels of your grace, that we will live out the ministry of reconciliation that you have entrusted us with. Father, may others see in us the light of the world shining in this coming week. And Father, wherever that light shines, I pray it will dispel the darkness and the violence will abate and it will be replaced with the shalom of God and the agape love of Jesus Christ. So Father, lead us and guide us in this coming week. May our lives be a hymn of praise to you and may it lead the lost into your kingdom. Thank you for speaking through us with your spirit. Thank you for surrounding us with your angels. Thank you for guiding us into those divine conversations. Thank you for stirring up our hearts and bringing us conversion and conviction afresh on this Sabbath day. For these mercies, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.